Pedro Sanchez has been once again elected Prime Minister of Spain. How did he manage to cobble together a coalition? A new report chronicles the impact of climate change on health. What are the factors that affect public health and health systems? And finally, air pollution in India's capital continues to worsen. Why are New Delhi's residents struggling? This is the Daily Debrief. These are your stories for the day. And before we go any further, if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. Pedro Sanchez of the Spanish Socialist Party has been re-elected Prime Minister of Spain months after an election that did not give any party a majority. Sanchez managed to get together a coalition which included Basque and Catalan nationalists, a very controversial move which led to very violent protests by the right wing. What are the challenges before Sanchez and what will its agenda be? To know more, we have with us Anish. Anish, thank you so much for joining us. Elections were held in Spain in July and uh, it's been many, many months and uh, the negotiations took a long time clearly. And in fact, in these elections, Sanchez's party was not even the leading party. So could you maybe talk us through how this coalition itself happened? What, what, was, the, what was the kind of discussions involved and how did finally Sanchez become the prime minister again? So yes, Prashant, what we've seen over the past four months are very intense negotiations between the PSOE and pretty much every major uh, regional party that uh, there is in the Congress right now uh, who are more Republican or left inclined at this point in time. And uh, we have seen a very different set of concessions uh, given to each of these blocks, uh, including Sumar, which was the junior uh, coal ruling coalition partner in the former Sanchez government. Uh, the Sumar pretty much uh, secured a, a reduction in working hours, uh, weekly working hours for uh, workers in Spain. And apart from that, the most contentious definitely was the amnesty bill. Uh, which definitely sparked uh, a massive protest uh, by right-wingers. Uh, massive and also violent, let's add to that as well. Uh, there was an attempt to siege, uh, lay siege on the PSOA headquarters and also attack uh, certain other coalition partners as well. So we have seen that and this definitely came uh, with very, uh, you know, very rigorous uh, coalition uh, talks that probably hasn't been seen in Spain uh, in recent memory. And uh, nevertheless, what we are looking right now is a set of promises, promises that will actually bring in uh, more fund, more funding, more investments into, uh, you know, the rural uh, Spain, uh, especially uh, the more minority blocks like uh, Galicia or uh, Basque or uh, even Catalonia in some, uh, in, uh, like one of the coalition partners did uh, call for a couple of billion dollars in investments. So what we're looking at uh, is going to be a more spread out uh, investment for development, for uh, uh, any kind of uh, you know new investment projects uh, from the government. And that is definitely what has been clinched at this uh, thing. But what we are also looking at is the prominence. Obviously they uh, existed, the more nationalist uh, or you know separatist kind of groups have already existed and have always been, uh, have been there in the parliament for a while now. But definitely none of them uh, were able to influence government making to the extent that, that it has uh, at the current moment. So definitely uh, their prominence has risen, uh, even though many of them lost seats, lost votes in the last uh, in the snap election uh, that held, that was held in July. Um, but uh, many of them are now basically kingmakers. And in this case, they will have a significant say in the coming government, especially towards its policies. Uh, to uh, the minority regions that have been calling for uh, independence of some sort over the past decades now. And Anish, of course, this has also led to violent protests by the right wing. So could you maybe also talk a bit about that? Yes. So uh, it was not unexpected because definitely the right wing uh, have always called for a more uh, you know, rigorous crackdown actually to, on the on those calling for a separate nation, especially those in the Catalonian region, uh, and that has uh, that is pretty much the reason why uh, the amnesty bill for the protesters 
uh, especially the leaders uh, who do identify as Republicans, who want the monarchy to go, uh, who want uh, Catalonia to be an independent nation, uh, are, uh, you know, is something that was the most contentious for them. And, uh, you know, violent protest, uh, as I pointed out, uh, included trying to lay siege on the party headquarters of the PSOE and also other places, uh, attempts to attack uh, leaders of the left. And that clearly uh, brings out a sort of ideological uh, battle as well to the forefront that was not seen uh, for a very long time in Spain. Uh, and this uh, clearly shows that uh, there is now going to be a more polarized uh, Congress of Deputies uh, where the right wing uh, will be more vocal and, be and maybe even more uh, assertive or even violent at some level, in some cases uh, in with the upcoming government that includes people who it sees as na enemies of the Spanish nation or whatever. But definitely uh, what you're looking at is also a consolidation of the more Republican and left wing groupings around Sanchez and that consolidation will have its own impact uh, in the long run. So we have to wait and see how this new government is going to take shape. If you will have uh, these new parties, these new coalition partners uh, being part of the new government, or if they're going to be there just for the supply vote and confidence vote, uh, and how they're going to influence government policies on a whole range of issues, because this is probably the more a more left-wing and more Republican kind of government that Spain has seen in recent memory and definitely more left-wing than uh, the previous Sanchez government. So definitely what we're looking at uh, is going to be at, at least expectations of uh, a progressive set of policies on major issues that are also, uh, you know, that's also facing Spain right now, especially when it comes to immigration or for that matter, uh, you know, austerity that has been, you know, a major issue and obviously the cost of living crisis and how the government is going to deal with it in the coming years. Ranish, thank you so much for the analysis. We'll see how this government, uh, you know, pans out considering the various pu pulls and pushes that are going to definitely be there. As you said, very different kinds of agenda as well. Uh, challenge for uh, the Sp Spanish socialists under Sanchez on one hand, which have always sort of tacked to the center, but also very interesting moment for the Spanish left in terms of whether they can actually capture more space after, their, uh, after they kind of declined for a while in between. Thank you so much. The 8th annual report of the Lancet Countdown on Health and Climate Change, which was released on November 15th, shows the impact of climate change on health and there are many. For instance, elderly people and infants are now experiencing twice as many heat waves per year than they would have had in, in 1986 to 2005. Similarly, the spread of infectious diseases is increasing. The report is called for climate-driven health action. To understand what this means, we go to Anna. Anna, thank you so much for joining us. And we have talked about health systems and health, uh, public health a lot on this show. And definitely climate change likely to be one of those factors which will really accentuate uh, you know, the cracks already in these systems, will really be an attack on public health on its own, so to speak. So first of all, could you sort of explain some of the major aspects of this report, especially the kind of impact that climate change is likely to have on health crisis in general? I think that's one of the main points of the report, actually, is that, um, you know, you cannot pinpoint to one specific health outcome of the climate breakdown, but that the biggest problem is, is that they are so interlinked that at some point the, uh, the effects are going to affect human health uh, and planetary health, of course, uh, in one way or another. So, you know, we're talking about impacts on food systems. We're talking about the impacts of deadly heat uh, or on the impact of floods, uh, but also uh, to increases in prevalence of uh, infectious communicable diseases, which we had not seen in certain parts of the world before, uh, or we have seen among uh, a smaller number of people than than we are seeing now and that we will be seeing over the next, next decades. Um, I think that one of the points which the report makes uh, a very big highlight of uh, is uh, the impact of heat waves, of extreme heat, of droughts uh, on people all over the world. So, you know, it starts with saying that uh, because of uh, various forms of uh, heat waves uh, and of droughts, um, there are now uh, almost 130 million people more experiencing uh, food insecurity. Uh, in over 100 countries 
uh, in 2021 than there were uh, in, for example, in the period between 1981 and uh, 2010, if uh, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, that's only the impact on food security, which we know that has uh, extensive uh, health implications because uh, it impacts children, it impacts older people. It means that more, more children uh, do not have access to adequate uh, quality and quantity of food. Uh, that leads to the one hand to stunting, to under uh, to the uh, prevalence of uh, of underweight among children. But we also know that it leads, you know, uh, in a world where the commercial determinants of health are not well regulated, it can also lead to the increased uh, consumption of food, which food which is uh, which is bad for health. So that's uh, that's definitely one of uh, one of the outcomes to to look out for. Um, but then, you know, it uh, it also makes a point that uh, we have to take into consideration that heat directly is causing more and more deaths. Uh, so, you know, uh, specifically, if you look at uh, a couple of categories of uh, pop population categories, uh, which are especially vulnerable to, to the impacts of heat, and that is older people, so people over 65 years of age, and then children under the age of one, they are now experiencing um, among... So essentially they're they're experiencing twice as many heat waves than they would have in in the previous uh, reporting periods. So that's you know it's it's a big increase. It has uh it, it has the potential to damage health in in a number of ways uh, ways. And then finally you know it's not uh, it's not only the direct impact on on health but it's also impacting health through uh impacting uh, the economic uh, determinants of health. Because of the heat, we know that many people, especially those who work outside, so for example, the agriculture sector is uh, especially vulnerable to this. Uh, agricultural workers uh, experience a loss of labor hours because they are not able to work or they are not able to work without compromising their health. So that is an additional, uh, additional layer to, to what we're seeing here. And then, of course, you know we can talk. You know we can also talk a, a lot about what's happening with uh, the infectious diseases because we have seen um, dengue outbreaks recently, which is uh, connected to how how cl the climate change um, uh, trends are going. Uh, we are also seeing an increase, um, well, in uh, in the spread of uh, of bacteria that can cause. A diarrheal disease, and this is because of the rising temperature of sea temperature of the, of, uh, of sea, which makes more and more coastlines uh, adequate habitats for uh, for the development of of these bacteria. So essentially, it's uh, it's a combination of factors that we are looking at, uh, and it's impacting the global south more than it, uh, than it is impacting the global north. Um, Although it has to be said that there are problems in the global north because of climate change as well. Right, Anna, that was the question I was going to come next, which is that like uh, climate change in general itself, it's not an umbrella term. The impacts are different on different parts of the world. So I, I presume that the health impacts are also going to be, in that sense, uh, very different. So could you maybe also take us to that? Well, yes, and again, you know, it's uh, it's something that we we've been seeing for a long time, and that uh, climate activists and health activists have been pointing out that will be a problem all along, and that's that uh, global South countries are more exposed to the impact of of climate change than those in the uh, in the global North, uh, and that again happens in many ways. We know that you know we have seen uh, very recently the effects of the droughts uh, in parts of Africa. We know that. Um, Parts of Latin America are, are also experiencing uh, widespread problems because of that. And the issue is that it's uh, not these countries who are actually responsible for what is happening. Uh, and them uh, being forced to shoulder the burden while not being uh, offered any kind of retribution for what is happening is what's making uh, it's what's making things worse, essentially. So... Um, but again, I think it's worth mentioning that even uh, even when we talk about this unequal distribution of uh, of health burdens in the context of climate change, um, we have to take into consideration how these different effects overlap. So we start with a situation where already these countries do not have health systems which are comparable uh, comparable on on certain level. We know that the health systems in Africa and Asia in Latin America have been weakened in different ways compared to those in the global north. 
so you start from a position where it's already very, much more difficult for a health system to respond uh, to the effects of climate change that we're seeing. So how are the health systems in West Africa going to cope with uh, a rising number of people who are suffering from heat stroke or uh, who do not have access to clean water or who have less and less access to, to nutritious food? So this is something that you know really uh, is highlighted in the report. It's highlighted in the uh, in the reactions of the WHO to this report, and it's something that needs to be addressed uh, in a broader scope than uh, what we're talking about, uh, you know, if only we've, we're focusing on, on climate change. Right. Anna, thank you so much for that. Definitely an issue which in the coming years and coming decades will be very high on the agenda of activists and governments definitely need to take notice as well. Thank you for talking to us. And finally, India's capital, New Delhi, is struggling with air pollution. The city's air quality index remained in the severe category. What is worse is that the weather conditions are likely to perpetuate these issues in the coming days. Delhi is not the only city facing this crisis though. Many Indian cities have been dealing with poor air quality in what has become an annual affair. We go to Pragya Singh of NewsClick to understand some of these issues. Pragya, thank you so much for joining us. Pretty alarming visuals from New Delhi right now. A poor air quality, you know, people having difficulty breathing. And this is not just today's situation. It's been the same for many days now. In fact, it's almost an annual uh, event, this kind of a poor you know, situation uh, in the streets of Delhi and the skies and in many other Indian cities as well. So maybe could you first take us through what's happening and what are the reasons for this poor air quality? Right, Prashant, it really is an annual feature. Uh, you know, one of uh, our regular columnists, D. Raghunandan of the Delhi Science Forum has actually said it's a festival and we should you know, mark it like a festival. Uh, I mean, he's not actually trying to be funny. What he's trying to say is that uh, not only is the pollution very high, but the kind of solutions that the various state governments and the center government are coming up with are not working. So the sources of pollution uh, is where the problems begin. It's actually uh, traffic, uh, you know, the, uh, the traffic flying on the roads is the biggest source of pollution in uh, most Indian cities, in uh, most parts of the country. Um, yet, you know, uh, the focus seems to be on events that occur, temporary events that occur from across the year. So there'll be a festival or there will be crop burning, which is a result of, you know, the farmers being in a rush to plant the next crop and, uh, you know, not wanting to lose out on the sowing season. So the focus is entirely on uh, events that do cause pollution, but are not the primary cause of what the uh, scientific community would call baseline pollution. Uh, the base pollution is very, very high, uh, double or triple the uh, accepted limits uh, across the year. So you have very high pollution and then you have certain events like festival where crackers are burst or you know uh, the farm fires. And then when the situation gets very bad is when the media steps in and talks about it. The other sources of pollution, of course, are household waste and waste burning and uh, construction dust, and then finally road dust. So uh, depending on where the city is, if you're like Delhi, the capital, then you're surrounded by areas which have all of these problems. You move your industries out, you move the, uh, you know, the uh, power generation sources um, based on diesel a little farther out, but then the breeze will just blow them back in. Or you, know, you try stopgap measures which don't work, which I think we can talk about too. Right. So, Brigitte, coming back to that point, what are the kind of solutions that are coming up? Because I think that's very key. Like, the, like you said, this becomes subject of conversation this time uh, around every year. And then there's a flurry of experts coming in, you know, various bodies intervening, sometimes even the courts. But what are the kind of solutions being proposed and uh, ideally what should be done? Right, uh, Prashant. So I had to actually list those out because they're uh, so varied and uh, sometimes a little fascinating, actually, the uh, solutions as well as the so-called solutions. So odd even, uh, which is supposed to be a way to cut the traffic on the roads to half, um, it didn't work because the Supreme Court wanted to know, well, does it really work? And uh, the Supreme Court is not entirely wrong in asking this question because... Uh, just to clarify, odd even is when vehicles are, you know, there's a separation, right? Yes. Uh, odd even is when you are told that the uh, uh, registration plates, which are even fly on one day and then so on and so forth. So that didn't work because the Supreme Court basically said, does it work? Uh, and, and, you know, they had a point there because there are so many exclusions to this plan 
uh, introduced in Delhi and attempted by other cities that, you know, uh, it was questionable how well it was working because of that. Then you have smog guns. Now, uh, you know, even I cross uh, over this, you know, the border of Delhi with uh, the neighboring state to reach my house every day. And there's a giant construction site with this one smog gun. It's a pathetic site. You need, you need thousands of these um, and, you know, uh, I don't think it's possible to install that many, but a lot of money around the country is being spent on these kind of stopgap measures. Uh, what is being done for controlling uh, the pollution arising from the transport of goods and passengers and the transport uh, and the vehicles which ordinary people use, uh, there's really no word on that. The other thing is that this because it's a human cry so the governments i think feel pressured to take strict action strict action like you know last week one of the indian provinces they actually arrested farmers 10 of them they took uh, hefty fines were taken for them for uh, having burnt the crop residue the, the thing is that you know for the farmers it is a kind of a compulsion to burn their uh, crop stubble until a solution that works is found but for passenger traffic, you can have alternatives like public transport, which solve this problem. So, um, you know, a lot of the experts are sort of throwing up their hands in the air and saying, why don't we work on those solutions everywhere across the country? Across the year, you get reports of how public transport is not only not prioritized, but deeper. The number of buses is reducing the uh, you know, the metro construction seems to be sort of slowing down. Maybe it's got to do with the economy. So those are the things which people are saying you need to focus on. Finally, let's look at Delhi. It moved some of the diesel-powered power plants out, but the pollution problem remained. Similarly, in coastal cities like Mumbai, you saw the similar levels of pollution, people unable to breathe, toxic fumes, as you see in very landlocked, landlocked areas like Delhi. So obviously the solution need to be found so that the base level of pollution goes down and that isn't being done at all. Right, Pragya, thank you so much for talking to us. Like you said, it does seem like what we need are uh, uh, throughout the year structural solutions which actually manage to mitigate the impact rather than you know last minute hand wringing and sometimes very misguided solutions as well. Thank you so much for explaining that. That's all we have time for in this episode of Daily Debrief. We'll be back tomorrow with another episode. In the meanwhile, visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org, watch our videos, and if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button.